also, if you're on the frozen Niagara coming up a little bit later, this isn't your tour either. You need to stay under this shelter until that starts in about 30 minutes or so. A um, few things that we need to go over, though, before we get our final call. Uh, this is a two-hour, three-quarter mile trip. Not all that long, but still two hours without a restroom. So keep that in mind. Uh, make sure you can handle that. Uh, if there are emergencies down there, there are emergencies. Yeah, so howdy, it's Jim Marotto. And this is a little video I put together. Man, I, I taped this back in 2014, actually August of 2014. This is the Domes and Drip Stones tour at Mammoth Cave. And as you can see, we're actually being bussed out to kind of an, uh, a side cave of Mammoth Cave, which is always kind of fun. You're, you're not going through the classic original main entrance that you you have to hike to from the visitor center they bush out there and they've got a special entrance which is pretty cool again this is i i, I videotaped most of this i'm probably gonna try to not edit much of this out just to give you a feel of a complete unedited cave tour at mammoth cave feel free to fast forward skip around do what you want to do this is a great guide he's about to talk Fill in some of those gaps back there, you guys. You guys are good in the front. You don't have to. You can't. <laughs> yeah, people in the back, though, just fill in those gaps. We're all friends here. Nobody's going to bite. Or at least I hope not. <laughs> okay, those of you coming in, just push forward. Come up close. So... Mammoth Cave, you know, there's a lot of variation as far as tours go here. Okay? Depending on the time of year that you come here, this time of year, most things sell out. Uh, we have a lot of sell out tours, which means we're probably getting close to 100 people on this trip. Uh, just because it's so early in the morning, sometimes we don't sell out quite as much on this trip. But uh, these tours sell out. I had 120 on a trip yesterday. It's really neat to have that. But if you come in the winter, I've had one person on this trip. Right? There's a lot of variation. Now, I enjoy taking more people in there, too, as well, because it, it, we can get an interesting group. We can find out where everybody's from, how many states are represented, and I like to figure that out. So I'm going to kind of point around and see, just call out which state you're from, what country you're from, or whatever. Uh, what are you guys from? I am Lexington, Kentucky. Lexington, Kentucky. Okay, I'm a Kentuckian, too. So there, there we got that. And I see a UK hat there, I'm assuming Kentucky as well. Okay, what about you guys? Illinois. Illinois, Chicago, okay. Ohio. Ohio. We're from Illinois, but Central. Illinois? Central Illinois, okay. Indiana. Indiana? Michigan. Michigan. Michigan? we got to have Michigan people. Anybody else from Michigan? Yeah, a lot of sauce. Awesome. All right. Hold on right there. Michigan. Michigan? Indiana. Kentucky, Indiana? Indiana. 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 Champaign, Champaign, Illinois. Anybody else? Any other states? Missouri. Missouri. Okay, there's a little variation. Well, this isn't as, quite as uh, different. What was that? Wisconsin. Okay. Well, it, uh, most of the states are around here, but that's fun too. Uh, welcome to Mammoth Cave National Park. Uh, my name is Matt. Uh, I'll be leading the cave tour today. This is Sue. She's going to be trailing us. As you know, no, not the German tour. <laughs> but if you're, are you from Germany? Cool. They win. He wins. Yeah. Um, yeah that's, that, that's, that's definitely the winner. Um, my name is uh, uh, Matt again, and I'm going to be turning the lights on in the front. I'll be talking to you as well. Um, this is Sue. She's going to be staying in the back, turning lights off behind us. So where do you guys think you need to be throughout this entire tour? Between the two of us. Right. Uh, you do not want to see the unlit portion of Mammoth Cave without a guide. That's a very awkward experience. I can promise you that. Now, before we go on any cave tour, we have a list. A uh, card of health warnings, safety warnings, and resource conservation here that we got to go over. Now, as far as health warnings are concerned, we've really covered most of them. Know your limitations. You shouldn't have any problems. Now, if you feel like you're nervous on this tour, don't let anybody pressure you into going on a trip like this. If you think you're going to get scared down there, you're going to panic, much better that we know that now so we can call somebody and get you picked up. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, but also realize a lot of people go through Mammoth Cave every year, and sometimes injuries occur. Hopefully that's not going to happen today. If it does happen, it tends to be things like twisted ankles and bumped heads. Not what you would consider a big deal up here, but in the cave, it becomes a much bigger deal. Think about where you are. You're in the middle of nowhere in Kentucky. I'm from here. It's the middle of nowhere in Kentucky. You're going under the ground in the middle of nowhere in Kentucky, and you're going under the ground the longest cave in the world in the middle of nowhere in Kentucky. 
everything is a big deal. Evacuation from the cave to a medical facility can and typically will take several hours if you're any distance from an entrance, okay? Be very careful. Follow the safety rules. We shouldn't have a problem with that. The first safety rule is by far the most important. Watch your step. The trails are going to be uneven in some places. Some places it's going to be wet. Actually, a lot of places on this tour it's going to be wet. Watch out for those spots. The trails are clearly marked. Usually, or in a lot of places, you're going to have handrails. But sometimes you just got rocks along the sides. Don't sit, step, climb, or lean on those rocks on the sides of the trails. Too much of a chance of getting one of those injuries. Uh, also, throughout this cave tour, there's a lot of low-hanging rocks that we refer to as naming rocks. Because you name them, whatever you exclaim after you bump your head on them. Now, try not to name rocks. Uh, it happens, though. Uh, I've done it myself a few times. If you do name a rock, you got a lot of kids on the tour, Keep those names at a G rating or below. Um, also, for the kids, if you are 16 years or older, or younger, sorry, not older. If you're 16 years or younger, you need to stay within an arm's reach of somebody that is 18 years or older in your group. Uh, if something goes wrong down there, we want to make sure that family units are together. Now, the reason I say this, and I say something's going wrong, that, I don't want you to panic. I'm talking about lights going out. If the lights go out initially, Panic can ensue. Uh, it won't last too long. We'll get the lights back on as soon as possible. But it's a lot more calming if you got your family with you. It also leads to less awkward situations if that person that you grab when the lights go out is somebody that you know when the lights come back on. So uh, position yourself next to somebody you know or somebody you want to know on the cave tour. Now, uh, anybody bring a camera? Want to take pictures? Good. We want you to take pictures down there. But I have been doing cave tours here for a while. Actually, quite a few years now. And when I take people on cave tours, I, almost every tour I have somebody come up to me and talk about the last time that they were here. I have never had somebody come up to me and say, I remember getting this great shot here. I remember getting this great picture here. They come up talking to me about the experience of the cave. I want you to take some pictures, but I want you to experience the cave as well, not just that viewfinder on your camera, okay? Take some pictures, but also have some fun down there. Also realize we can't take too many. we got to stay together. Uh, we can't let big gaps occur in the group. Uh, so take a few, don't fill up your memory card, and experience the cake. Uh, also realize on tours like this that pacing is kind of counterintuitive. In the front of the group, we have the slowest, steadiest pace. The back of the group, at times, you're going to be standing still, waiting to get through bottlenecks. But after you get through that bottleneck, you're going to be going a lot faster than we go in the front. Okay? So position yourself where you think you'd be most comfortable. If you want to go slow, start moving up to the front now. That's the best time to get up here, okay? At any of our stops as well, if you want to go slower, get up in the front. And that's most of our safety rules. Your safety is our first priority. Our second priority is to protect the cave. This is a national park and a natural resource that we're going into. We want to keep it in great shape. So we ask that if you bring anything into the cave, bring it back out. Uh, don't litter down there. Anything that's in the cave stays in the cave. No souvenirs to be taken out. No food or drinks besides water. No tobacco products down there. Um, a lot of people have this urge as they walk along to rub their fingers along the walls and ceilings. Don't do that if you can avoid it. Now, if you're about to fall down and all you can grab is a rock, grab a rock. If you need to steady yourself and all that's there is rock, use the rock. But try not to touch when you can avoid it because those oils can really stain the rocks. We don't want that to happen. Uh, also, uh, riding. Not a lot of riding down here. You may see some from the 1920s and 1930s when this was first discovered. And you may see some more recent stuff as well. But as long as it occurred before July the 1st, 1941, it's considered historic graffiti. After July the 1st, 1941, when we became your 26th National Park, it became a federal offense. And uh, <laughs> it will increase your ticket price exponentially. So uh, please don't do that. Uh, and really, that's most of our rules. Anybody have questions about the rules? Good. Well, two things I need to discuss before we go into the cave. Two types of rock that we have in this area. Up on top of these hills, we have a type of rock called sandstone and shale. Now this sandstone and shale cap rock acts as a roof to Mammoth Cave. It doesn't let water come in from above. That's why for most of this trip, you don't have to worry about water dropping in on you because we have a nice roof on top of us. But beneath all of that sandstone and shale is a layer of limestone, actually a very large layer of limestone, about 750 feet of limestone laid down by an ancient sea. And that limestone is soluble. That sandstone and shell cap rock, it really can't be dissolved that easily. But when water comes down in the form of rain, picks up carbon dioxide from the air and soil and leaf litter, that water becomes a weak carbonic acid. A uh, weak carbonic acid that can dissolve limestone. So it comes down, hits the cap rock, and it just flows to the sides of the ridges. Now, it wants to get down to that limestone because then it wants to sink down to the river level. 
and come out into the Green River, which is our main water source in this area. That's why we have caves, water dissolving holes in that limestone. It can't get through that cap rock, so it just flows over the side, and even though it can't dissolve it, it can start to break it apart or erode it. If it makes enough cracks in the sandstone and shale, the water starts to dissolve the limestone beneath, and it starts to take out the foundation of the cap rock. And if it takes out enough of it, there's a collapse, making these bowl-shaped depressions. One's over there in the bus loop, one we're about to walk into. Anybody know what these things are called? Sinkholes. Sinkholes are drainage systems to the cave. Water continues to funnel down through this sink uh, into the lower levels of the cave and eventually empties into the rivers at the lowest levels of the cave to get out to the river on the other side. Uh, these are drains. So as you go down the stairs, you are walking down the drain of Mammoth Cave. And as you do, be very careful because it will be slippery. There's a lot of low-hanging rocks. We made the trail fit the cave. Not the cave fit the trail. So please be very careful as you go down. Enjoy it. Take time to stop and look up and down in times, but also make sure we keep up with the group uh, so we don't get too spread out in there. Does anybody have any questions before we get into the cave? What's the temperature? 54 degrees. Cave temperatures typically take on the average yearly temperature of the surface latitude. So all around the globe at this latitude, if you go into a cave, it's going to be about 54 degrees. Any others? Okay, go down this hill. We're going to go into a door. There's another door after about 20 steps. That's the blasted section. After you get through that, it's relatively natural. There's going to be, of course, stairs and some concrete down there, uh, but we did very little alteration to the cave. So enjoy it. Uh, the next time I'll see you guys as a group, we'll be at 250 feet below the surface in a place called Grand Central Station. So follow me. Yeah, and that, uh, that was Matt doing a great little intro there for the Domes and Dripstones tour. And like as I mentioned, and as you just saw, they kind of bust us out to this, um, not, you know, not the main legendary uh, original entrance to Mammoth Cave, but kind of a different one. So yeah, they brought us by bus, then Matt did an intro, Matt the Ranger, and he could do stand-up. That guy was just funny as heck. And he kind of reminds me of my buddy Dan in Akron. which has nothing to do with this, but he just reminds me of my buddy Dan. Yeah, so um, just kind of did that d intro. He mentioned that there are about 100 people on this on this particular tour, and it, it doesn't feel like that. It doesn't feel like that at all. I mean, it's a, it's a good group. It's a large group, but it didn't feel like 100 people. And, yeah, I mean, it uh, just had a kind of a nice spaced-out feel, and... And the tour went well, which was good. It's, that's always good. All the tours go well, though. They've, they've always got great guides. I, I remember most of the guides that I've had at Mammoth Cave, and they're all really, really good. And, and as I mentioned before, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna try not to edit too much on this and leave it close to its original length. I did go back and I realized as we were going up and down these stairs, there are a few moments where it's just total blackness. And I think I edited out about a minute of us walking up and down the stairs. Still, I left quite a bit in there to give you an idea of how, oh, just almost Escher Maze-like it is going in. You, you go in, yeah, they've got a little door that they can uh, lock, obviously. And, you know, you're still out in the woods, but you go through this very obviously man-made door. And then you go mostly down a whole bunch of steps and, and I was reading on one of the brochures for Mammoth Cave that there are like 500 steps you take on this tour it's only three quarters of a mile but you go up and down a whole lot of steps which which really makes the legs sore afterwards you feel like you've gone a whole lot further than than three quarters of a mile but yeah this is just really cool I mean I I'm always fascinated by how they get all of these steps, ramps, staircases into the cave. I mean, this this was a crazy bit of labor to get all of this stuff in here for people to safely walk around. And I'm just, I'm just always impressed with it. So, yeah, as, as we're walking to our first stop... Just, just look around, and yeah, the, the ca again, the camera is shaky. It's not the best camera work. You know, sometimes there's just a few inches between me and the person in front of me and behind me. 
lots of shadows. But I still want you to get a feel of just how... I don't want to use the word claustrophobic. Because I've been in a lot tighter caves. You know, especially wild ones. You know, there's moments that you're just crawling through holes for the most part. But even even in a big open cave like this, it feels very, very tight at times. So yeah, I just wanted to give you a little uh, perception of how that works out. Also wanted to mention real quick too, uh, you, you can't mention Mammoth Cave without talking about Floyd Collins. And while we've got a couple of minutes before we get to the next stop, I just wanted to mention in a recent Kentucky Monthly magazine, March 2021, they have a, a really well done article by a guy named Bob Thompson out of Mason, Ohio, who pretty much says anytime you read about Floyd Collins, they always mention that Charles Lindbergh was basically on standby waiting to fly out, you know, information to the newspapers when Floyd Collins was trapped in Sand Cave. And this this article talks about how, you know, all of the Floyd Collins biographical books state that. However, anytime you read some sort of a biographical book on Charles Lindbergh, uh, it looks like he was not at Mammoth Cave and Sand Cave at the time Floyd Collins was trapped in Mammoth Cave. And, and he kind of backs it up with uh, mostly with Charles Lindbergh's accounts of his life. And it just looks like he was not in the area at that time. However, he talks about how Lindbergh was at a, um, at a camp at Mammoth Cave in 1921. And he did visit, I believe, Crystal Cave. Yeah, Crystal Cave, led by Homer Collins, Floyd's brother. And he did meet Floyd at that time. So he actually did cross paths with Mammoth Cave and with the Collins family. Just uh, just not when everybody says he did. And I just I thought that was pretty interesting. I, I just wanted to mention that somewhere because I know I've put up other videos on YouTube talking about Lindbergh being at Sand Cave when Floyd Collins was trapped in the cave. Anyway, if you're not familiar with Floyd Collins, uh, he was a, an explorer, a caver in this region, a legendary guy. He got, uh, as he was looking for a new cave and, and, and doing what he did, he, his leg gets caught and he's trapped underground and he will never come back up above ground alive. And it's just a fascinating story. But yeah, I, I, just, I just wanted to mention that. There, this uh, Kentucky Monthly Magazine goes over that. I used to get the Kentucky Explorer, but it, uh, it ended its publication run, which was very sad. But Kentucky Monthly agreed to fulfill all, all the subscribers' subscriptions with Kentucky Monthly magazine. So I've been enjoying that lately. I've picked up Kentucky Monthly before. I, I like it a lot. It's a little bit slicker than, uh, than the Kentucky Explorer. If you read the Kentucky Explorer, it, uh, it was newsprint. It was very much black and white. They, they print a little bit of color on the cover, but uh, once you open the magazine up, it was all black and white. It was a very DIY kind of magazine. Lots of um, reader-submitted articles. It was jam-packed. Kentucky Monthly is, is much more of a production kind of magazine. It's it, Like I said, it's slick. There's uh, you know probably lots of photoshopped pictures inside. It's a good magazine, uh, but Kentucky Explorer will, des will be missed horribly. And um, uh, to Kentucky Monthly's credit, they are trying to kind of put a mini Kentucky Explorer within each issue. And I, I do like that, and I hope that goes well. But I, I wanted to mention that real quick. They had a nice article about Charles Lindbergh and Floyd Collins. Eh, kind of, kind of uh, debunking what's popularly thought of as uh, the Floyd Collins-Charles Lindbergh connection there, so... Anyway, so yeah, we're still walking through on the Domes and Dripstones tour. Uh, I hope you haven't gotten too dizzy. But uh, we're almost to the point where Matt told us to go to, to listen to him a little more. 
but yeah, they do they do they do have the rails up. Uh, a lot a lot of moving around going on here, but but I, I always feel pretty safe in Mammoth Cave. I, I have been in some other caves where I've walked on some stairs and uh, eh, a little shaky. But Mammoth Cave, uh, obviously, they they always have high standards. They're managed by the National Park Service. Yeah, I've, I've just always encountered great friendly guides here. Matt, obviously, is one of them. You know, these are always, you know, National Park Rangers that know what they're talking about. They care about their jobs. They care about Mammoth Cave. And they're just a lot of fun. And uh, as, as Matt was on this particular day. And I also wanted to mention real quick, I, I like the fact that when you go to Mammoth Cave... You don't just buy a ticket and go into Mammoth Cave. You know, they've, they've got a ton of different tours you can take. Um, and a couple of the tours they do, sometimes they do by lantern at night, or in the evening anyway. And then some of them they do during the day with artificial light. There's, I mean, there's so many variations on tours, and just so many different tours you can take of the cave itself, and of a couple of other little side caves that they manage. With more to come. Uh, I understand. Uh, hopefully when things get back to normal. But but yeah, I just love that. I love the fact that, you know, if I want to go down to the cave and just do a self-guided tour, I can probably do that. Or if I want to take a massive four-hour or more tour, there's a good chance I can do that too. You know, especially when things get back to normal, I'm sure they'll have their normal, regular cave tour schedule going on and I'm looking forward to that and there's th you know there's several tours I've taken over and over I think everybody's been through Fat Man's Misery been past the Giant's Coffin and the TB clinics multiple times but it's always exciting to do it again and I always enjoy going I love to yeah especially when they have uh, those big windy staircases and you can kind of look over and really get a feel of just how massive you know, even the little small part of the cave you're in at that moment is. I just, I love that. Uh, and obviously they've cleaned out paths so people can walk through here and all. But, you know, it's still a very, very much nature-created cave. And it's just always, always a lot of fun being there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have to wait a few months. Uh, there's some large passageways out there. Uh, if you go to Borneo, which is where the official biggest yeah. cave is, there's a room in there that's over 20 acres in size. So huge. I mean, you're talking about a quarter of a mile from one side to the other in some places. So it's huge. But what it has to do is save it. So if it's a passageway that's huge and it still has water flowing through it, after that water leaves that passageway, then it's going to be very unstable. Uh, because rocks have to fall to the chamber. Mm -hmm. But water's not been flowing through here for a very long time. We don't really have to worry about rock fall in the cave. Uh, it can be used. The largest you'll find in Mammoth Cave, though, is about two acres. It's the biggest race we've got. Have you ever found any fossil stone in this cave? I have. Now, I've pointed out a few to the people in the front, but it's just going down those stairs, there's no other way I can really do it. I can't really show everybody. As we're about to leave this room, though, I'll point out a pretty neat fossil for the whole group to check out. I'll have Sue and Luke light on it. Right here. You see, it looks almost like a honey bun in the ceiling there, those little circles? Yeah. That's what we call an ammonite. It's an extinct species of cephalopod. Now, you may think of what a cephalopod is. No, a cephalopod, a, sna a snail is a gastropod. A cephalopod is something like a octopus oh. or a squid. Or have you guys ever seen a nautilus before? It's got this kind of twisty shell. You've seen it before? Yeah. These kind of look like nautilus. That's what they would have looked like. They're, they're, they're extinct. We don't have them here anymore. But that's what we call an ammonite. We've got a couple of them right there. So as we go up, I'll have Sue point that out so you can get a good look at them. Okay? There's a lot of fossils that are just not in places I can show the whole group. Any other questions? Feel free to ask. If I have to repeat, that's okay. Just want to get your questions in. Yeah, lots of things that live down here. 
Uh, most common animals are the insects. Uh, you passed a few thousand of one type of insect as you came down the stairs probably. Picked up one of them right there. It's a great um, this is waving to you. Uh, that's a cricket, and um, that's the most common animal in Mammoth Cave. There's millions of these down there. Uh, now, you probably won't see too many of them because they blend in pretty well. But when we get to the frozen Niagara section, our last little part of this tour, the last maybe 16th of a mile or less, uh, there's a survey of up to 3,000 crickets at a time in that passageway. So if it looks like the walls and the ceilings are moving, that's what these are. Uh, now, uh, also beetles. There's about 30 different species of beetles that live down here. They rely on the crickets for food because the crickets have to go outside and bring sunlight energy in in the form of their wand, their poop. Uh, they bring that in. Fungi will grow onto that. Molds will grow onto that. Beetles and other insects can eat that mold. Um, also, uh, the eggs from the crickets are a big food source for some of the beetle species as well. That's pretty much all they'll eat in their whole lifespan. Some of these. Uh, there's also a whole bunch of other arthropods, a couple species of spider, tiny little things, not something you need to worry about. Uh, there's a pseudoscorpion, also very small. There's a millipede, a centipede, uh, there's a fly. Snakes, no, it's too cold. Way too cold for snakes. 54 degrees. They, they regulate their body temperature by their surrounding environment. They're what we call exothermic. They can't handle these cold temperatures. So you won't find any real reptiles in the caves. Around entrances, sometimes you can find amphibians. Some frogs like to hang out in the cooler entrances, as well as some uh, uh, salamanders. Have you ever seen a cave salamander? Has anybody ever seen one? They are orange with polka dots. And I'm not joking. They really are. They're really neat looking animals. Uh, they like to hang around the entrances. They won't go very deep, though. Um, Bats, of course, down the water table, there's a fish, there are two fish species, a, a crayfish, a shrimp, a whole bunch of little crustaceans that live down there. Um, that covers most of them. The largest animal that inhabits the cave is the eastern wood rat, also called the pack rat. They stay around entrances, though. They don't go very deep. Anybody else have any questions? Is there, is, where's the natural entrance is that, since you said that was man-made coming here? How, how is the cave discovered then? Well, the, the Mammoth Cave system was first discovered when people found the historic entrance. So, I recommend that when you get back to the Visitor Center, if you get a chance, well, we are running what's called the self-guided discovery tour. When we get done with this tour, that'll be running. If you want to go on that, you can go into a natural entrance and see some of the big historic passageways over on that side. Okay. Uh, if you don't want to do that, though, you can still just walk down to the historic entrance. It's just down the road under the bridge that connects the hotel and the Visitor Center. And uh, that'll take you down to the historic entrance, about 200 yards down to that entrance. It's beautiful, big, huge opening. Because the self-guided discovery tour is running, though, they won't let you go down into it. They'll just let you see it from above. But it's uh, still something everybody should see. That was the first one discovered. We have about nine or ten natural entrances to the cave. Most of them are just little crawlways and a crack that somebody discovered. Uh, and then we have 26 total entrances. That means even about 16, 17 of those are blasted. The reason they blasted a lot of them were to allow for easier access to certain parts of the cave. You know, visitors were going deep into the cave in the early days. They would be going on sometimes 14-hour trips in the cave, going on a boat across uh, to different sections of the cave from the historic area of the cave. And they didn't think that when we became a national park that they would want to do a 14-hour tour. Um, they wouldn't be that interested. So uh, they blasted some entrances so they could get into those same places. If you have a seat, scoot as far over to your left as possible, just so when people come in, they do have a seat. Can I see a hand back there? Yeah. My daughter wanted to know um, how, how you build the, the artificial. How we put the staircase in there? Yeah, how, how um, so the original staircase, after George Morrison blasted our entrance in 1921, he had a wooden staircase built within a year. <laughs> Quick, he built a staircase and started taking tours down here. The wooden staircase was actually a good staircase, but it was treated lumber. And the treatment was being leached off and taken down into the lower levels of the cave, and that was bad for the ecosystems down there. So in 1966, we took that staircase out, and we started to replace it with this stainless steel one. It took three engineering groups to finally finish it. We had it finished in 1986. They were working from both the top and the bottom and kind of meeting in the middle. Uh, but between those cons, you, you could come in the way we're going to go out, but you couldn't come down this way. Okay, those of you that didn't... Uh, See one as you're coming down, you passed a few thousand probably of the most common animal in Mammoth Cave. And there's a cricket, just so everybody has seen one. You'll see probably more of them later on. Um, just again, waving hi to you. See there? Just waving. Um, did uh, everybody enjoy that staircase? 
<laughs> mixed reaction. Well, everybody enjoy the views from the staircase. Yeah. yeah. Pretty neat passageway, huh? And one of the only places you can experience something like that is here. It is amazing going down through that. And what I like to do today, I'm going to try to explain cave geology to you throughout this tour. At least mammoth cave geology to you. And geology is a pretty complex subject. And really the biggest, the hardest part for people to grasp is time. The geologic time scale, really hard for us to grasp because we talk about millions of years like it's a blink of an eye. So what I like to do is I like to take the life of the cave and all the different life stages that we're going to see of the cave today and put them into the life of a human and do a comparison. Now I'm still going to give you some dates. But I think it's a little easier to grasp that if, if we, uh, we stick it into the life of a human being. So, back there, those vertical shafts that we were walking through. If I wanted to give that a life stage, I would call that the kid. The young one. Very young passageways. Now, why is it young? Well, that's because it's constantly changing. If I have any kids in the group, when was the last time you guys had to buy a pair of shoes? Last week? When's the next time you're going to have to buy another pair of shoes? Next week. Because what's happening? You're constantly changing. That's what's happening back there. Water is pouring in through those sinkholes. It's dissolving limestone as it comes down vertically. And it's constantly changing those passageways. Now when I say constantly changing, it's not change that we're going to notice. In a century, you come back here, there's probably not going to be much more than a few millimeters difference. But it is changing constantly. That's the kid. And it's very different than what you're sitting in right now. Does anybody notice any obvious differences between this and that? What's some obvious differences? It's Dry, that's a big one. It's huge, it's bigger, it's got a big ceiling on top of it. Anything else? Back there it was vertical. This ah, is what? Horizontal. This is a different type of passageway completely because back there, Remember, we have a leaky roof. Water's coming in. It's broken holes in that sandstone and shell cap rock. Above us here, though, that cap rock is thick. In some places, it's 50, 60 feet thick. Water is not going to be able to penetrate through that for a very long time. Stay dry here all the time. If I was going to give this a, a life stage or a personality, I'd like to call this middle-aged. It's a cave that's stuck in its ways. It's not going to change very much. Why? Because it has a nice roof on top of it. Water can't come in. Water is what changes this cave. It's what formed this cave. Water came in vertically back there. Guess what? It came in horizontally here at one time. To understand horizontal flow of water through these rocks, I like to give you a little visual aid. Look at my hat here. You notice there are four bumps in my hat. Well, there are four ridges that make up Mammoth Cave, four hills of rock. One of those is called Mammoth Ridge. That's where you are right now. There's Tui Ridge, Joppa Ridge, and Flint Ridge. And all 400 miles that we've mapped and explored in Mammoth Cave fall in those hills in about 49 square miles in south central Kentucky. And when water comes down and hits the top of these hills, it's hitting that sandstone and shale cap rock. So it doesn't have an option of going straight through. It moves off to the sides. It drains over to these edges. Now, the water that comes over on this edge and comes down into this valley, it's happy water because it's getting to our main water source, the Green River. It runs right through the middle of Mammoth Cave National Park, and that's where all streams and all tributaries eventually want to go. So this water, happy. Water that comes over to this side, though, comes in through sinkholes. That water has a problem. It's got a hill in its way. Does water move uphill really well? So rather than go over the hill, the water goes through the hill. It comes in from the side, through these little cracks that you see between the layers of limestone called bedding planes. That water starts to dissolve the crack a little bit because it's got that carbon dioxide dissolved in it. A carbonic acid solution dissolves away this passageway. At one time you had a river flowing through here, just making its way through the ridge to get to the Green River on the other side. That's how this is formed. Now I tell you that. Has anybody ever uh, uh, seen the rocks at the bottom of a creek before? You ever picked them up? Are those things jagged or smooth? Smooth. Because if, something flo if water flows over rock for long periods of time, it smooths it off. I want you to look at that rock. 
Is that jagged or smooth? That's jagged. You look even back here in some of these places. Is that jagged or smooth? It's jagged. That's not smooth rock. So that means that water must have not flowed through here. So I just lied to you, right? No, I didn't lie to you. Water flowed through here. But a lot of the water was flowing under us. A lot of the, flow, the water was forming a passageway below your feet. And as it flowed through, it would empty into the Green River. But the Green River is not at the same level as us anymore. At one time, it was only 250 feet below the, into the rock, into the ridge that we have here. That's where we are right now. We're 250 feet below the surface. But the Green River since then has cut much deeper into its valley. The water in the cave that was forming this passageway drained down and started to form passageways below us. And then it cut down and formed passageways below those. And if you were to cut through this floor about 110 feet, you would be swimming in Mammoth Cave. There's still rivers down there, still forming horizontal passageways, still emptying out into the Green River on the other side. That's how this stuff is made. Now when these waters left this chamber, it became unstable. Rocks fell from the ceilings and walls. That's why we see all this breakdown around us. That's why we see all this breakdown up this hill that we're about to go up. And it continued to fall until it made an interesting shape. Look how the wall angles up towards the ceiling. It has one ceiling layer and then angles back down on the other side. Anybody think of a shape there? It might remind you of McDonald's. An arch. Archways are one of the most structurally sound shapes in nature. If the rocks fall to make it, we're safe. There's no temperature changes down here. The humidity stays relatively constant. Rocks don't expand or contract. They just stay where they are. Now, when George Morrison got down here, he dropped his nephew down through those vertical shafts. He blasted a hole in that sinkhole, tied a rope to his nephew Earl, dropped him down into it, and told him to explore, find a way. And he did. It took him about two weeks to get here. They built a staircase, a wooden staircase down those vertical shafts. They came into this chamber with tours within a year. And uh, when they came down here, they couldn't go up in this direction because the rocks had fallen and blocked the passageway off. He noticed that smoke was being pulled up this hill, though, from lanterns and smokers in the cave, and he knew something had to be up there. So, being the brave man that he was, he sent his nephew Earl up that passageway. <laughs> Earl shifted a lot of rocks, maybe blasted in a few sections, and eventually popped out into a different type of cave. Again, we've seen the young, we've seen the middle-aged, and our next stop, we'll get a little introduction uh, to our last personality. So, any quick questions before we continue on? Okay, well, as we go up this hill, I want you to keep an eye out. Look at the rocks that are on the floor. They match up really well to the ceiling. It doesn't take much imagination to see where this one came from, does it? It's really easy to see that. So keep an eye out for that. I'm also going to have Sue come up here in the front and point out a fossil to you. I've had a lot of questions about fossils. There's a neat fossil up here called an ammonite. An ammonite fossil is an ancient cephalopod. And if any of you have ever seen a nautilus before, it looks just like them, really. And I think the, the fossil looks kind of like a cinnamon bun in the ceiling. Uh, so check this thing out as you go past. And uh, I'll see you guys as a group after we get up to the top of this hill of rock at a place called Fairy Ceiling. But you can follow me and check out this fossil. That, uh... Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, and how about that? Matt showed us a cricket, and more interestingly, yeah, kind of pres preserved uh, critters there in the cave. I was pretty impressed with that very first when he pointed out the uh, squid octopus like critter. I thought that was pretty neat. And who would have thought? But uh, yeah, if you've if you've been keeping up with the news, not too long ago there were some uh, remnants of a shark found in Mammoth Cave, which I just think is is pretty darn cool. So yeah, that was great of him to point that out. And we're we're going up a another weird stair kind of thing at the moment. And and I actually ended up yeah, I'm going to edit out more of this than I expected. I edited, a, I edited out a pretty good chunk here just because it gets really uh, dark and unfocused. So this is, uh, yeah, still going to be a whole lot of the tour, but I've edited out just for the sake of time and uh, quality uh, a whole lot. 
a video that's just pretty much darkness and that kind of thing. So this is normally about a two hour tour, I think, from the time you leave the visitor center until the time you come back. So that, that might give you a point of reference if you're wondering how long this is. But yeah, it, it was it was a little bit of an exhausting hike F from this point on. Going up these this stair ladder thing was uh, it was a little bit tiring, but also again very interesting. And you know, Matt's covering a lot of science on this tour. This is more of a science and geology based uh, tour, so they you know they don't get into the uh, you know, Civil War and the, the early guides and, and some of that stuff the way they do in some of the other tours. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. So if you're into history, if you're into the history of the cave, if you're into geology, you know, there, there's very specific tours that might be yeah better for you than some of the other ones. Like I said, though, I think they're all great and a lot of fun. But, yeah, there's, there's uh, different tours. You know, for different people, depending on what you're into, which I think is just, uh, just great. And I, I've been on most, if not ever, one of these tours at some point or another. I, I actually made a checklist not too long ago. I know there's some I went on when I was younger, and yeah, it's it's okay to go on them again though, but just just because they're so much fun. And we're we're kind of stopping up here at some benches. I'm sure Matt will have something else to say here in just a moment. But yeah, we're going over to like a little, uh, not amphitheater area, but uh, definitely a place to, to sit for a while and and hear what the ranger has to say. Anything you're wondering about? Trying to get your breath, I get it. <laughs> um, something a lot of people ask me about when we're at this point. Now we're going to talk about what those things are hanging from the ceiling there in just a few minutes. But a lot of people wonder about the ceiling itself. Yeah. Yeah. You looked at it, really flat. Looks kind of like a bad plaster job, doesn't it? It's not. It's a natural layer of limestone. But anybody remember their elementary geology that they learned? How many types of rock are there? There's three. One's called what? What are the three? Igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary. Right, we got the three. Good job. So, igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary. Now, we don't have igneous and metamorphic in this area. Not at all. All we've got is sedimentary rock. Sedimentary rock is sediment of something. All of this rock was the sediment of an ancient sea called the Mississippi Sea. that covered Kentucky and a lot of other parts of the United States uh, from about 300 to 350 million years ago. And that sea laid down a lot of muck. Laid down a lot of dirt, laid down a lot of precipitated calcium, laid down a whole bunch of animals and critters that had died in that sea. And those became the layers of rock that we have here today. 750 to 800 feet, depending on where you are, of limestone. It's just the sediment of an ancient sea. Now, we do have that sandstone and shell cap rock as well. Now, that was laid down later on. The sea was still over us. But what we have became, we were moving northward, and we're almost dry land. We're kind of like the Gulf of Mexico. And we had a freshwater river emptying out on top of us, making a delta. That river laid out a whole bunch of sand and a whole bunch of mud. The sand became the sandstone, the mud became the shale. And that's our sandstone and shale capital. And that's how we got that. And we drifted up, and we became the layers of rock that we have here. But remember, every layer has got millions and billions of tons of rock under it. Millions and millions of tons of rock above it. So that means that every layer is going to get compressed. It's going to get flattened off. So large expanses of limestone that were laid down over this time are typically going to be pretty flat. Not always this flat, uh, but pretty flat because of that compact that you have when it happens. You'll notice even back here, another layer of limestone was supported by the walls because they were able to be a little closer. You see, it's still flat, not quite as flat as this layer, but still a very flat layer of limestone. Some little pits. And even if you got real close to this, if you got right up on it, it would look a little less flat than it was in this advantage. Uh, but that's why we have this seal. Because those rock layers are compacting each other. Now, any other questions though? Anything you're wondering about? Come on in, you guys, take a seat. Let's get over to the left. Yeah. Wait, how long have we gone so far? Like how far have we traveled? Like is it then like 
Uh, probably a little bit more than that, but not uh, not a lot more than that. Uh, we're about at if you're if you're gonna with metric system, I don't know. I'm not really sure about as far as metric is concerned. Um, we've probably went a little short of a half a mile into the cave right now, uh, and uh, we're gonna be we have a, a little less than that up ahead of us. So we'll walk through. There you go. <laughs> that makes sense. I, I, I think we should definitely be metric, but I still, when I'm in here, I don't think metric. When I'm in the lab, I think metric all the time, but I don't yeah, think metric. <laughs> exactly. Well, and it just makes more sense. It's easier to work with, but we just get yeah. stuck in the yeah. in the old English system that the English don't yeah. even use anymore. Based in works well. <laughs> now, anybody have any other questions? Anything else you're wondering? Not really? Okay. Where do they got that smooth over here? This, well, it's not, which, which one are you talking about? This is not cement, actually. Oh. What this is, is a dirt pack trail. This was built by the Civilian Conservation Corps back in the 30s. What they did to make this is they, they kind of followed the old tour routes in some places, and what they did is they made them more stable. They found flat rocks and laid them up on top of it, big flat rocks. Then they filled in all the cracks with uh, smaller rocks, and then they laid gravel over the top of it to get a nice flat surface, and then they packed dirt on top of it. And that's what we walk on. And over the last you know, 70, 80 years, we've been packing that dirt down. And in some places, you're going to feel a lot of bumps. That's area where the, the gravel is sticking up through the dirt. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's, this, is a natural, this is all used from natural resources in the cave. Uh, it's not a natural passageway or a natu natu uh, natural floor, but uh, we used everything from the cave. Because uh, during the Great Depression, they didn't have the money to bring in stuff uh, to make nice paths. Pathways. I thought they did good. Looks like. Hmm? Looks like they did good. They did a great job, but they didn't have the stuff. You know, we couldn't bring in cement and, sure. and a lot of uh, machines. Even though you know, back in the 30s, they didn't have a lot of them anyway. Uh, but they uh, did a great job. Yes, very little maintenance on this stuff over the last 80 years. But um, I'm sure if they had something to make it a little easier for them, they would have preferred that. <laughs> now, one of the processing areas for gravel was actually up here where you see these large layers of limestone laying down. You'll notice a lot of broken up gravel next to it. This is where one of the places that they would break up the gravel to spread out over the floors in pretty much all these sections. Now when we get to the frozen Niagara section, we are going to have a lot of concrete because it's so wet there. They put that there so it wouldn't get muddy. Everybody scoot as far over to your left as possible. I'd like for everybody to have a seat in here. We should be able to fit everybody. You guys in the back, come on up a little bit. We got some along the corner here. Um, just for something we're going to do, it'd be nice to have everybody seated. Uh, we're uh, probably a little shy of 200 feet, uh, so about 190 so feet below uh, the surface. But it's, uh, that's a range, an estimate, because we can't really be for sure. There's lots of pits and things up at the surface, and uh, we can't be for sure what it is. But it's about, about 190 to 200 feet, probably. Okay, well, we've all made it to this room. And again, I told you when we got to this room, we were going to see a different part of the cave. Uh, we're still in dormant Middle Age Cave, really. Uh, this cave doesn't have water coming in. You don't see any. Do you see any water dripping on you? Do you feel any water dripping on you? No. It's still breakdown canyon passageways. It's even a better version of it where you see the rock layers fell down layer by layer to support the ceiling making these archways. You can even see back there where the walls were closer so they were able to support a layer above, below that. So that's, that's kind of neat to see here as well. But what's really interesting is when George Morrison was taking tours up into this room, apparently somebody on his tour said, look at the fairy castles. You see the upside down fairy castles here? Two of them, fairies going into the castle, fairy I-65 to fairy village over here. <laughs> this is your first example of the third life stage or personality of Mammoth Cave on this trip. Now this is a very small example. But this is different. Now, how I'm going to interpret this type of cave may be a little different than a lot of other caves. Because you go to a lot of caves and you see all sorts of stalactites and stalagmites, and they like to refer to that cave as living or active cave. I don't like that description. I don't think it's that accurate. Because cave is a hollow space in something that we can walk through or climb through or crawl through. A human being has to fit through it. What these are, and that rock right over there, that's not cave. That rock over there is not cave. Just like those formations coming in right now, they're not cave either. This hole is our cave. 
So what's happened here is we have a leak. Now, unlike the leak up on when we were coming in the cave, where we have those big sinkholes and water's being funneled in, that's not what was happening here. Water was coming in, but it was coming in pretty slow. It was seeping into the cave. And that water, still slightly acidic, dissolves some of the limestone. And it comes into a chamber like this and hangs from the ceiling for a while. Now, you know that, carbon, that carbonated water that you have in your sodas and soft drinks? You guys ever drink a soda? It gives it the fizz? That's the same thing that I was talking about earlier, carbonic acid. It's just dissolved carbon dioxide in water. That's what makes this cave. That's what makes these formations. And has anybody ever opened up a soda and sat it out for too long? What happened to it? It goes flat. It loses its acidity. It loses its fizz. Well, those water droplets that come in from the ceiling, they hang there long enough that they go flat. They lose their fizz. If they do that, they can't hold that dissolved limestone any longer that it has in it. So it redeposits it on the ceiling. Or it can drip down and start building up from the ground. Now, if it comes down from the ceiling, what do we call it? Stalactite. It's got a C sound in the middle for ceiling, holds tight to the ceiling. If it drips down and starts building its way up, we call it a stalagmite. stalagmite. It's got a G sound in the middle for ground, and it might reach the ceiling. Sometimes a stalactite and a stalagmite meet in the middle. What do we call it? Column. Column. If it comes out the side of the rock and flows down, we call it a flowstone. If it comes out looking like a drapery, we call it a drapery. If it looks like a ribbon, we call it a ribbon. If it looks like bacon, we call it bacon. If it looks like popcorn, we call it popcorn. It's all the same stuff. It's redeposited limestone. And what is it doing? This stuff is slowly filling the passageway back in. Filling in the cave. It's not living or active cave. It's dying cave. It's cave in its last stage of development. It's redepositing this rock, filling up this passageway. And it's also taking out some of the calcium from above and weakening the rocks above you. So it can also cause collapses in certain places. It's not something we have to worry about here or anywhere on this tour, but it can start to do that. So when you see formation-rich caves, what you need to remember is those have a very short expiration date compared to something like most of Mammoth Cave and most of what you're standing in right now. Now, if you look up at those formations, you're going to notice no water is on them. These are inactive formations. Wherever that water was coming through at one time, maybe it's been diverted somewhere else. Maybe it's been plugged up so water can't come through anymore. But they could become active again. And eventually, if those things grew all the way down to the floor and completely blocked that section of the cave off from this section of the cave, this area would no longer be part of Mammoth Cave because you can't get to it from all other places. So uh, it's kind of a, an interesting way to think about it. If you want to think of it as living or active cave, feel free. I just think dying's a little bit more accurate. Now, I've introduced you to three different personalities and life stages of the cave. But in all actuality, you have not seen Mammoth Cave yet. Because all of Mammoth Cave has one thing in common. It's dark. Anybody interested in seeing the real Mammoth Cave? Okay, to do this, I have to have your cooperation. If you have a light on you, turn it off. If you have anything that glows in the dark, cover it up. If you got those little blinky shoes on, don't dance around for a few seconds. More of it as we go along. I'll go ahead and tell you that's green algae. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about why that's here when we get to our last stop. <laughs> no, this is actually one of the older caves. The reason you don't have a lot of formations is because that sandstone and shell cap rock doesn't let water in. Uh, we're protected. This cave has a much longer expiration date, uh, but if you go to the edges of the ridges where we're real close to the side of the hill where that cap rock's starting to disappear, that's where you'll start to see formations. There's a lot of places that the rocks look really precarious. Do they get rock falls sometimes? Not really. And that's, again, because of the constant temperature and humidity, no expansion or contraction. Everything stays where it is. Now up ahead, we're going to go down a hill into a passageway that looks very different. It looks kind of like the first passageway you walk through after you finish the stairs. You remember that low ceiling, real smooth walls? That's called a phreatic tube, and we're about to walk into another one. Uh, this passageway was completely filled with water, but when the water left, the passageway had enough of an arch-type shape that it could hold itself up. 
and it's still, that's the same passageway the water was flowing through a long time ago, where in these passageways, most of it's below your feet. So check that out as you go past it. Then we'll continue through some of the more of these breakdown passageways, where actually two passageways kind of collapsed into each other. And then we'll have one more quick stop right before we get to the frozen Niagara section. Uh, talk a little bit about conservation, then you'll see all the pretty stuff. But follow me. Yeah, and Matt covered just a whole lot of ground there from a scientific standpoint, and, and that's um, yeah, just interesting stuff. I, I, I enjoyed him talking about the uh, the uh, CCC building, uh, doing some work there at the cave. I always think that's fascinating. Those guys seem to have uh, done a lot of work around all sorts of parks throughout the U.S., and it's just always neat hearing about them. One of my uncles was in that program at one time. I also enjoyed him talking about the um, the paths and how it's just kind of compressed dirt. I thought that was fascinating. This is something to think about too. And again, just uh, just the the structure with the stairs and how they build that stuff is crazy to me. And I, I felt kind of bad, you know. Again, the lighting's not good down here in Mammoth Cave for videos and when I filmed this I was just filming it thinking eh, this will be something nice to to look at several years down the road I had no intentions of putting it on uh, YouTube or anything like that so this is uh, yeah just yeah, I was kind of filming for my own benefit here and of course Matt was seen kind of in silhouette there at different times he deserves better than that but uh, but that was the best I could do I guess most importantly, though, I got his audio. I got what he was talking about. And I, I think that's really kind of the main reason, well, one of the main things you look forward to, it's one of the main things I look forward to on the tours, is hearing what the uh, the guides and the rangers have to say. I mentioned earlier, too, if, if you're not familiar with Mammoth Cave, you know, there, there's a ton of different tours you can take. And they've also got other programs around the park. Um, I've mentioned it here before. In fact, I've, I've worked on a video where they do... It's it's a, a Floyd Collins tour. It's like a caravan tour. And it's, it's free when they've offered it in the past. You basically get in your car and you follow a ranger around to different stops in the park relating to Floyd Collins, including his grave site and where he died, where he lived... And I love that kind of stuff. They also do programs out at the cemetery with the old guides. And uh, a, lot, a lot of that kind of stuff. So that's that's just a lot of fun. Just just a ton of things you can do in this in this area, too. There's other caves. Lots of shops, of course. It's just a lot of fun. Oh, sorry. We're out the corner of here. Lots of formations. Any questions before we on the roof, though? Besides what the green stuff is, again, I'll talk about that in just a minute. What are the escalators supposed to be on? <laughs> Never. <laughs> come on in, you guys. Fill in some of those gaps in the back there. You guys can come on up around here a little bit, too. It doesn't matter. Or we can fill in these spaces just so everybody can come in. How does the oxygen get here? It's a convection current system. So if you guys go down and feel the historic entrance, and I say feel, I don't mean touch because we don't want to touch the rocks. But when you go down there, you're going to feel cool air blasting out at you because the warmer, less dense air on the surface is rising and it's pulling the denser, cold air out of the cave. And uh, it, that leaves a void in the cave so that then the air circulates back around through the ceiling of the cave. So there's just this constant flow of air in and out through cracks and natural entrances. Uh, so we get a complete oxygen exchange down here every few hours. So it's just the same as it is on the surface naturally. Caves breathe. Actually, the Greeks used to call them anthros, which means nostrils of the earth. <laughs> Any other questions? You mentioned that there's 400 miles of explored cave. Mm -hmm. What are they doing to explore more of it? Well, we have a group called the Cave Research Foundation that comes in here about 10 weekends a year. Uh, they're a volunteer organization. They go in and uh, explore more. They go deeper into the passageways. They map and survey new parts of the cave. 
but re you realize that it does take sometimes many hours to get to the new section. So they're not adding a lot of mileage quickly. Yeah. Uh, it takes a while to compile, compile much. Uh, we are very close to connecting to about the 10th longest cave in the world called Fisher Ridge Cave. If we make that connection, we'll be up over 500 miles at that oh, point. Wow. Uh, but uh, that's how you make big discoveries and add a lot of mileage mm -hmm. quickly. Otherwise, it's just a real slow process. Well, if it becomes connected, then is it, still, is it going to be Fisher Ridge Cave or Mammoth Cave? Well, it'll still be Fisher Ridge <laughs> Cave itself, but it does get included into the cave name. See, Mammoth Cave, it's kind of misleading. Mammoth Cave isn't really called Mammoth Cave. Uh, the cave that we connected to Flint Ridge was a longer cave system when we made the connection. The rule is the longer cave gets the first name. Okay. So this is actually the Flint Ridge Mammoth Cave Tui Ridge, Joppa Ridge, and then it would be the, the, that ridge connection or whatever okay. you call it. But um, it, they would still call it Flint Ridge, but it would be included in the name of the Mammoth Cave system. And you guys in the back, just keep coming down a little bit, fill in some of those gaps. We'll make sure everybody gets in here. Any other questions? Do they have any guess as to how much is going to be found? I mean, is there some kind of sonar technology? Or There's no way to know for sure. Uh, estimates from geologists typically range from about 700 to 1400 miles. Those are all the ones I've heard. And then most of the scientists that I've heard kind of stay right in the middle around a thousand or so. So they're just scratching the surface. Yep, there's still a lot to find. Uh, yeah. Well, if you think about exploration, every time those people go in, they pass passageways that have never been explored. And those are what we call leads. And there's a book of leads that's over 50 pages long in Mammoth Cave. So there are hundreds of passageways that people have not been able to explore yet. Many of those probably don't go very far, uh, but that's going to add up to a lot of mileage. It just takes a while to explore all of them. Okay, we have made it to a place called College Heights Avenue. And we're about to run into the frozen Niagara section. Now, something I want to point out, and something somebody asked me about a minute ago, was this green stuff, algae. Green algae. Should that grow in a cave? No. No. Anything that's green and alive, uh, it, does, it goes through a certain metabolic process called what? Photosynthesis. Photosynthesis. Right. The use of sunlight, or some form of light, to produce sugars and as a byproduct, oxygen. That shouldn't happen down here. But we altered the environment. We brought in lights that were very inefficient. They put off too much light. That light was at the wrong spectrum. We brought in algal spores in our clothing or in our hair, it gets on the walls and it grows. And it does really well. We don't like it. It's not supposed to be here. But what we can do is learn from our mistakes. Today we don't use those inefficient lights. We use LEDs and compact fluorescents. The lights don't put off as much heat. They don't put off as much light. The light's not at the right spectrum. So you start to see it browning or dying off. That's a good thing. We don't like this in here because it's not natural. Up ahead, when we get to the frozen Niagara section, you're going to see a lot of mistakes. Up there, a lot of people have touched the formations. I want to stress to you, do not touch formations. Remember how they're formed, water droplets. And if you touch a formation, you leave oils behind. What happens when a water droplet hits an oily surface? It slides off. It doesn't deposit where it would naturally. So please don't touch. Enjoy it. Look around, take some pictures, but please don't touch the formations. You got handrails through most of this section? You may need them. It's pretty slippery back here because our sandstone and shell cap rock's gone. We're going to go into this dying section of the cave that has tons of formations growing in around us. It's going to be real tight in a few areas. Be careful, uh, but please don't touch. There's an optional side trip up here. We're going to walk around a few corners and you're going to hear water falling from the ceiling. That's the early stages of a vertical shaft, like what we walked down at the beginning of this tour. It's called a shower bath springs. There's a gate there and a staircase to your left. I'm going to go down the staircase. That goes down in front of the frozen Niagara, which is a 45-foot flowstone formation. It's beautiful. And there are 49 stairs going down in front of it into a room called the drapery room. Just beneath the frozen, beautiful, flat, sheet-like formations hanging from the ceiling. It's really neat. But remember... 49 optional stairs down, 49 mandatory stairs back up. <laughs> so if you don't want to do 98 more stairs, just stay at the top. There's a gate there at, the, at Shower Bath Springs. Sue is going to make her way to the front of the group there and start leading people that stay at the top out and those that are coming out of the drapery room. I'm going to go down into the drapery room, stay down there or on the first landing above it uh, where I can answer questions and talk to you guys if you have any of them. Uh, and uh, that'll be the, the rest of this tour. But uh, if you have questions, please save them uh, for the drapery room or Sue as you go out of the cave. But you guys.
guys have been a great group. You've kept up really well. You've had some great questions. And I do want you to realize this is the, probably the last time in human history that this group of people would be together at the same time. <laughs> so, because of that, and because you guys have been so good, I do want to thank you so much for coming. Uh, when you get out of the cave, you'll get onto the buses, go back to the hotel, and you walk across those white nose mats to help protect the bats. Uh, but I hope you guys have had a good time. I hope you've enjoyed being introduced to the personalities of Mammoth Cave. I hope you respect this dying part of the cave, and please don't touch it, but enjoy it. And on behalf of Sue in the Back, myself, and Mammoth Cave National Park, I want to say thanks a lot for coming. I hope you've had fun. Let's go see the pretty people. Right. Yeah, that was, that was great. Matt, uh, Matt got a well-deserved round of applause. As, actually, I think most of the guides do at the end of their tours when I've been to Mammoth Cave, and I, I think that's great. Yeah, a lot of good information there. Oh, he mentioned the, uh, you know, 400 explored miles of Mammoth Cave. I always think that's fascinating. I've always heard that to get to a new spot, to explore more, to add to that, an explorer has to hike into Mammoth Cave for about a week to get to a new spot where they can uh, find some more passageways. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but I wouldn't doubt it. But uh, yeah, I, just, I think that's uh, just another fascinating fact.
Okay, I'm, I'm behind you. Oh, Any questions, feel free to stop by and ask. Come back sometime to get a chance, okay? Uh, thank you, man. It's been a lot of fun, Matt. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for coming. Yeah, it kind of looks like bacon. I've always thought they look more like jelly. Oh, yeah. That has made me more hungry. You like eating jellyfish? <laughs> no. Oh, you think of jelly? I'm thinking of jelly now. Oh, okay. Peanut butter and jelly, you have a sample? Oh, 
popcorn flavored rocks. Look at it. You can suck on the popcorn flavored rocks. Hey, that was a lot of fun. Thank you. Good. Glad you enjoyed it. Appreciate it. Awesome. Oh, I'd like to thank our liberators. Uh, I was kind of uh, tough down there. Uh, we got by. Matt was pretty vicious with us, but you know, uh, we did what we could. <laughs> Do we get on? I assume we don't get on the same bus. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that was the Domes and Dripstones tour. Uh, again, I think that was back in uh, 2014 when we did that one. I hope you liked it. And there's just, uh, yeah, there's the buses that they use to bring us to this entrance of the cave and to take us back after our tour and obviously there Matt was a great guide and his uh, sidekick Sue was very helpful and we just had a good time with him getting on the buses to go back I always love how kids you know you always hear kids at the end of a cave tour getting all excited and they're talking about cave bacon and things like that I think that's just great and that was that was a fun tour after you went down to see the uh, falls area you came came back up the stairs and you just kind of wandered out and you had time to kind of look around and stuff. Oh, and on this particular day, I, I obviously turned my camera on while we were in one of the gift shops over at the Mammoth Cave Lodge. I love the gift shops. They there's two of them, and they have uh, they're both just cute little gift shops with colorful things. You know, I always love to pick up postcards and stickers and things like that myself, but. Um, yeah, this, this little gift shop just has you know, candles and, and things, decorative kind of stuff. And it's it's just a cute gift shop, too. But yeah, that was, uh, hopefully, I got most of, uh, of our ranger guide, Matt, talking and giving a lot of information, uh, especially about the cave formation and, and just the natural history part of the cave. And I thought that was just a lot of fun. And again, this is a great area. Mammoth Cave is always fun to go to. We sometimes go down and don't even do a cave tour. There's so much to do in the park and in the area. But uh, a cave tour to me is always really special. But yeah, and even even in the Mammoth Cave area, there's, you know, I, I love going to Big Mike's Rock Shop and some of the other little uh, novelty type shops around. I love driving around this area too. It's always so scenic. We almost always see deer every time we're at Mammoth Cave. Love going in the winter when the crowds aren't so big, but I love going in the summer too, uh, just just because it's a fun thing to do in the summer. But yeah, but that's that's it. I hope you enjoyed watching the uh, my video I made of the domes and dripstones tour at Mammoth Cave National Park.